Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. I wanted to go and give you a quick review of the Rotex 125 sander from Festool. Now this is a dual action sander. It acts as a disc sander as well as a random orbit sander. So in that sense, you get two in one. Now the uh, body has a nice handle all integrated. I like the 125 because it's a smaller sander so it's a little bit easier to, to grip and maneuver. But uh, there's also a 150 that I'll do a comparison of near the end of this video. Now, the sander itself has an integrated dust port here and attaches to your D27 hose, the regular tool hose. And up here there's the uh, plug it cable connection, so it's going to run just off the plug it cable. The heads are interchangeable. Here is the switch for switching between the two different modes. So right now it's in the fine mode, so it's in random orbit. And if we move the selector over, now it's going to be in a disc mode. And I'll show you that a little bit later, how they run. In the back, there's a ratchet block. When you press this ratchet lock while you're in the disc mode, you simply switch it over there to the disc mode, then you press the ratchet lock, now you can remove the head. So these heads are removable, which is nice because they obviously get a little dinged up like mine does occasionally. This one here is the semi-soft pad that comes with the sander. There is also uh, a hard pad that you may choose to use. This one here is significantly harder. This is nice when you're trying to do some of the initial work, and I'll show you that also when we get to the demo. And it helps in trying to keep flat. So you would just put the pad back on, again press the ratchet lock, and give it a turn until it locks into place and away you go. Now the sander itself is variable speed. You have the typical fest tool speeds of one through six, six being the fastest, and uh, power switch. That always comes in very handy for a power tool. The kit itself comes with an edge protector that you can use to keep the head of the sander away from any of the corners. So this will bump the wall before the sanding head will, but it's actually a very close fit. So you just slide this onto the front, and I always seem to miss the first time out. So now you can see that you would hit a side face before the sanding pad would start to cut into that face. Uh, I typically just leave that on all the time because it's not obtrusive and that way there if I do get into a corner like that I don't have to worry about being too lazy to go and stop and pop this puppy on. Now the sanding sheets are all the typical adhesive, the, the uh, typical hook and loop backs that the Festool uses. The nine hole, there's a uh, nine hole pattern on here so you just slap that on, very easy to, in, to exchange and move up through the grits. There's room inside the sustainer for storing a number of them. Actually, it's got a pretty good sized stack in there. And uh, that's really about it. Some of the, it'll come with a book that describes all the different abrasives. And there are a wide, wide variety of abrasives for these sanders. I and mean, obviously, any sander can use a variety of abrasives. But these are all the ones that work with the different uh, Festool sanders. And you'll find that there, there's different backings, different size grains, different uh, wear properties. They're all actually very well described in this booklet that you'll get with it. You might want to give that a look to make some decisions based on the uh, material that you're going to use, the media you're going to use. This is a set of hard felt pads that I purchased. Now normally you would use this with an interface pad. So you'd use an interface pad between your pad and these felt pads. Uh, but I've used them successfully without it so you can go at it either way that you'd like. Uh, just slap that on and away you go. Actually, since this is a hard felt, I would almost prefer to go straight with the soft pad, but there are interface pads available if you wanted to go a little bit more polishing. So I tend to use this when I want to buff wax off. In fact, that's what I wrote on the back to make sure that I know that this one's already charged up with some wax. Um, then I can just uh, use this to take that off. It does a fantastic job for that. And another thing that you can do, and this is a little different, is one time I needed to smooth off a, a surface. Now, of course, you can always take your Scotch-Brite and work that puppy by hand, but I had a very, a very large surface. So think half a sheet of ply uh, that I wanted to, to work the finish down so it was nice and smooth, no bumps, because I actually ended up getting a lot of nibs. So what I did is I took this, stuck it on one of these pads, marked a circle, and then took it off, and then cut it. And that actually worked very, very well. And I still have the pad hiding in here. And the airflow will flow through that pad, 
So if for some reason you, you need to, you're worried about the dust, you can always do that or just run it dust free. And uh, it worked great. It's not, not a bad trick. So keep that in your in your playbook as it were. So I thought I'd come and mention one other type of pad. Missed one, I knew it. Uh, that you can use. It was actually Mark Spagnuolo that turned me on to this idea a number of times when you want to clean like the surfaces of your table saw or your band saw, any of the like. Uh, it, it's a lot of usual elbow grease and nobody really cares to do that. So what you can do is you can get some plate and paper. paper. It's not really paper, it's actually foam that has uh, an abrasive embedded, embedded into it and it's really made for the automotive industry and they start at, like this one here is a 500 thousand, two thousand, up to four thousand. Now these are pretty expensive so you're going to want to probably find, if you're going to use it for this purpose, you're going to want to find one of the online dealers that will break a box for you and most of the ones that are on the Festival Owners Group will do that just fine for you. Now <clears throat> what I did with this actually is I took the 500 and I did it, I used it on my bandsaw table. My bandsaw table had a number of, you could see all the machine marks on the top and to, to clean that out I simply sprayed it with a little bit of, of uh, WB-40 and then I applied, used this on the sander and just ran that down until I got rid of most most of the marks and then worked my way up through the grits and now it's basically a small mirror over there. Now do you really need your bandsaw table to be that clean? In my case what I was finding is that the machine marks were deep enough that I was getting a little bit of a brassy hue to the top so it was getting a little bit of rust embedded into those grooves which is amazing because I'm in Arizona but once I did this now that top remains shiny all the time and actually you can uh, feel that it's a little slicker and I used the same thing when I had uh, I used to have a, na a neighbor that would come over here completely sweaty he'd push everything off my table saw and then lean against it I had three handprints that were rusted into my tabletop after one weekend that I didn't notice him doing that so this came in exceptionally useful uh, it's good to have on hand. Okay, at this point I'd like to run a small demo of the sander itself. I have a piece of purple heart that has one side that hasn't been jointed or cleaned, so it's just rough and ugly. And I'll, show, I'll take it through some grits and we'll see what it looks like near the end. You've seen demos like this online, but I'd like to explain a few things that aren't really were, uh, mentioned in that video. Okay, so I moved you in a little bit close. This is my purple heart. What I'd like to do actually is I'm only going to stick to one side of this purple heart for this demonstration. The reason being is I'm also going to do this demonstration on the other side with the Rotex 150. So let's just put this here in the middle. Hopefully it'll keep me on the other side. And I'm going to try working this surface here. Now I want to start in disk mode to get rid of all this crud. I actually don't have a really low grit. I'm going to start with 80. When you want to start with raw material like this it's really a lot nicer the hard pad lets you stay flat, but it also helps you when you're working a rougher surface like this simply because you can, when you apply a little bit of pressure, it's all transmitted down to the surface. If you're using a softer pad like this, uh, it's transmitted down, but because it's soft, you're not going to get a, a real, even, uh, real even cut, and then you're going to tend to want to tip it, dishing it. Now, if you pay attention, when you're, dip, when you're tipping it in order to dish it to get some more progress, really what you're doing is you're compressing it down so that it turns into a hard pad. So start with the hard pad. So we're just going to spin that on. I'm already in disk mode because I needed that to put the pad on. So let's pop the 80 grit paper on here. Now the uh, D27 hose into the back. Plug it cable. Now the uh, sander, this sander here can pretty much take the vacuum on at full vacuum strength. So you can pretty much leave it at the hair and uh, go with that. Some of the other sanders definitely need to go lighter. All right, here goes the noise.
deep bandsaw marks on this side, but otherwise we're feeling pretty good. Even though I hung out over here quite long, feel, it feels flat. Had I done that with the soft pad, I pretty much guarantee I would have a dish mark right starting there. So there's not any dust even on my hand, and that's what I was just sanding on. You don't really see much of anything here. There's always going to be a little when you're going off of the edge, so you can barely see a few little specks down there. So the dust collection is exceptional on this as well. I'm going to go ahead and keep it in disc mode, and since this is raw material, we'll go ahead and do uh, the hard pad still. So, 120. Actually, this is a good time for me to show what I had shown in my MFT video is I have a lamp here. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get much out of that. Kill the light up on the top. You're a little too far away for it to really be of any benefit, but I use this all the time. And like right now, I can clearly see that there are scratch marks right here that I didn't take out and just a few of them over here. Uh, granted, I'm in disk mode. Disk mode is always going to leave more scratches than when you go to the random orbit. But right now, I'm trying to just get this thing down flat, and then we'll go to random orbit. Actually, right now, I'm going to start with the 120 in random orbit mode so you can see that. But I'll take away some of these scratch marks first. to random orbit and you'll even hear the difference. Kitties never grab that with by your fingers, but yeah, once you get used to it, it's not bad. 180. any scratch marks much at all on here. Now I happen to only have up to 180 in uh, for the 125 so this is as high as I can go but this actually feels exceptional. I don't feel any dishing whatsoever and there's really no scratch marks to speak of. So uh, we'll do this side a little further when I get to the 150 review. There you go. I tend to use the hard pad almost exclusively. The soft pad does come in useful from time to time, mostly when you are doing something like if you're at a really high grit and you're trying to just work a finish. It's nice to have that one because you want to make sure that if you're tipped a little bit that the, spongy, the sponginess of that soft pad will take that deflection and not make it dig into the material. Whereas with this, it'll dig instantly. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Thank you.